Okay, I welcome everyone for the uh, English Museum discussion on Tuesday. Today is the August 2nd, Tuesday. So before go into the appointed topic on Kalahavivada Sutta in uh, Sutta Nipata, Parayanavagga. If anyone is having other things or any other interview reports or kind of thing, we can take few minutes uh, and then uh, can proceed to the not the Parayanavagga, Attakavagga, Kalavivada Sutta. Professor Bante, uh, we have not received any reports for today's session, Bante. So that means we can directly go into the topic. So then I will invite Venerable Puddharakita to present uh, today's topic, today's stanza, respectfully. Okay, I'm not... Um, um, I'll begin from this verse. From what in the world do contacts originate... From what do possessions too arise? From what do not from what does not exist is there no taking as mine? From what has vanished do contacts not touch one? Then the Buddha replies Contacts are dependent upon name and form, possessions are based on desire. When desires are do not exist, there is no taking as mine. Where form has vanished, contacts do not touch one. So here in this part of the, the sutta, uh, we get more and more into um, this linkage between uh, dependent origination. So the Buddha is, is discussing dependent origination and um, what he's linking it to is, is contact and also name and form and linking this to the second noble truth of desire as the origin of suffering so this uh, you can see how, how naturally the Buddha is weaving together these very deep um, fundamentals of uh, his teaching and, and I would also say to the practice as well because uh, contact is depending uh, eye object depending on the eye sense base uh, contact, eye contact, eye contact arises. Depending upon eye contact, uh, consciousness, eye consciousness arises. So again, here we go into the sixth sense bases, and uh, so these are really just fundamental ideas within Buddhism that the Buddha re repeats over and over again. And he does this because uh, this is how the teachings are going to be transmitted. Uh, he repeats them. He's an expert in uh, repeating the, the doctrine and the core teachings again and again and again. So uh, you might wonder how after two and a half thousand years we, we can sort of say uh, anything about what the Buddha was teaching. Um, it was uh, because uh, he encoded the fundamentals repeatedly in many, many different stories, in many different suttas, in many different contexts, to many different uh, people who would approach him about the Dhamma. He had this uh, sort of genius ability to uh, recast the same fundamental teachings again and again, suitable depending on the time, place and condition. And um, fortunately, the Mahateros of old were able to memorize and um, remember these teachings and uh, not just remember, like, say, one version of the teachings, but but uh, many thousands of different versions of the same teachings, the same underlining core teachings. So if you ask yourself later on, how do we know about dependent origination? How do we know about the Sixth Sense Basis? How do we know about the Four Noble Truths? We can see even here in these two verses uh, where the Buddha is teaching these fundamental teachings. So this, is, uh, this was part of the genius of how the Buddha established the transmission of the sasana down through the periods of time. Whereas if we look at other ancient teachings, um, this uh, integrity uh, is lost. Uh, you get different versions um, of, of the teachings in, in uh, say, in the Bible. You get, you get different versions. It gets very confusing. Uh, whereas uh, here you see there's a, a consilience of where the different teachings come together to like a twine and a, a rope. And it gives great strength to the teachings. 
So let's let's dive into what the teachings are talking about. So contact is a mental function. It's not referring to a physical contact. It's referring to a mental um, a mental uh, concomitant, a mental aspect of the mind that that is like we'll just say the physical touch, but it is the the mind touching the uh, the uh, the object. So what does the mind touch? It touches the um, the eye sense base or the ear sense base or the nose sense base. So these are what they call the doors of perception. So uh, there is a perception. There is something perceived at the sense uh, bases. And um, due to that uh, perception, there is uh, an object. Uh, so we call this, say, eye object. And then um, then the contact comes and touch the mind, contacts with that uh in this case, uh, eye sense uh, base object, and um, from that arises uh, eye consciousness. So once it's uh, it's at the level of eye consciousness, then it can be uh, like it becomes a pure mental phenomena. So, so once it's uh, become contacted, then we can have possession arise. So possession is again uh, a mental phenomena where we, we, we feel an ownership or we feel uh, um, uh, that, that this is a kind of... We identify with, with the object. So the, the fundamental thing is, is that, that uh, an object has arisen in the mind. It has become, uh, for instance, I, I consciousness. And then, depending on that I consciousness, uh, a possessiveness, uh, a mental aspect of possessiveness arises. So he he says here that there is no mine involved in this. So you don't you don't there is no mini me. There is no um, there is no soul. There is no uh, sort of small person inside of the larger body or something like that. Um, that that these are just different mental states arising. There is a mental state of contact. There is a mental state of eye consciousness. There is a mental state of possessiveness. And these are just uh, depending and arising because of causes and conditions. So because an object was seen at the eye door, uh, because the uh, eye faculty was working, then uh, eye con contact occurred at the eye door, then eye consciousness arose, and then depending on that, uh, possess possession uh, arose. The, the wanting to possess or to own or to identify with with the object. So he says, what does not exist is there not taking as mine? This is the question. What? So he, the answer to this is, when desire does not exist, there is no taking as mine. So desire is this kind of quality of the mind where it bends towards the object. It bends towards the object and it identifies with the object and it takes the object uh, as mine. And this is all happening within the 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 nama, within the mind faculty. So uh, one of the definitions of mind is that which bends. So the, the physical body does not bend towards the object. Uh, the, the physical object uh, is not, uh, does not have um, intention. It doesn't have, the, it doesn't have interest. It doesn't have attention. It doesn't have contact. It, it doesn't have all of these things. These are all part of the mind. These are all part of nama, what we call mind. And within the mind, uh, when, when an object has arisen in the mind and the mind uh, develops possession, it bends towards that object and it identifies with it. This is mine. So when... When form has vanished, contacts do not touch one. So what he's saying here is is that uh, contacts can uh, form the thing that you see, it arises and passes away. Uh, when we identify with the object as permanent, we, 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 we take it as permanent. This is mine and I am permanent and this object is permanent. Uh, this is mine. So when we see that in reality the form object is disappearing, then also we realize that, uh, that everything is arising, passing away, arising present, passing away, and um, there is less inclination for, uh, uh, for us to uh, attach, to take possession of an object, because we see it as impermanent, as... Um, not mine, not me, not self, not I, 
and uh, as a result we we have less and less suffering we have less and less dukkha because um, possession is is also based on on this sort of skewed belief that something is is eternal or um, is is present but when we see it as vanishing then we um, we 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 see this impermanent quality to it that it is anicca that it is anatta that it is dukkha then uh, this contact does not touch one anymore it it doesn't touch one meaning um, it doesn't become this abiding sense that 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 this is mine or uh, I look at at my body and I see that this is mine when in fact uh, it is it is arising present and passing away it is impermanent and um, and and it is not mine it is it is just depending upon nature it is depending upon uh, supporting conditions um, this can also be meant and uh, understood in another way which is uh, re- referring to deeper states of of meditation where uh, where we put aside form and we take formlessness as a, as an object of meditation um, but uh, this is a kind of a commentarial uh, uh, view on it um, I, I prefer to take the more vipassana view on it that we can experience in this very moment uh, the the impermanent nature of anything that the mind comes in contact with if we watch it uh, diligently and carefully we can see that in every present moment everything is arising and passing away and that form is vanishing in this very present moment and that uh, in this way contacts do not uh, touch one in the sense that they do not become uh, like an abiding delusion within the mind that uh, this is mine, this is self, uh, this is I. But perhaps Mahatero can uh, enlighten us further on this very deep uh, section of the sutta. Uh, this uh, particular part was a very uh, kind of a core teaching in the uh, stillness still. Nivane nivime. And uh, specifically, na sanya sanyi, na vitha, na visanya sanyi, that two times, two gatha times, we are reaching it. And that was very striking when I'm listening to Vendaban Jananda directly. And for that, he has to clear the ground, maybe about uh, 12, 13 talks. Then only he come up to this level and how much we are playing in this drama, how much we are playing in this illusion delusion and how much you are fighting how much take it seriously and fighting each other and all the kind of thing but uh, very difficult to go into that besides we have a good clearance of the ground so that happened uh, you can't do it in one hour's talk it is a long series then only you can understand namajarupanja paticca pasa the pasa contact is happening depending on the nama and rupa but Mahasi Saido uh, heavily argue. Uh, Jnana Ramaswamy uh, also heavily argue, but when you are meditation, Rupa Nama, Nama Rupa Pariche, the Jnana is the first and foremost Vipassana Jnana, but you have to start with Rupa. So if a Nama Rupa Pariche is the Jnana, you have to start with Nama. So that is the place educated meditators are get lost. They are always thinking that knowledge and the nama and everything is the foremost. And therefore, we have to start with Vedana Nupasana, Chitta Nupasana, Dhamma Nupasana. They never think Kaya Nupasana first. And that is being asked in the Chulla Vedala, Chulla Satchaka Sutta, uh, not by the Sutta, but by the commentators. They ask, even the name of the particular wisdom is called Nama Rupa Jnana, why teachers are insisting to start with Rupa Pariche, the jnana first, materiality, the, the, the corporeality, the, the, the tangible part, verifiable part. So that Venerable Jnana Rama never developed any heated arguments, but he cite why this Chula Satchaka Sutta raised this question, and during our time, there are a lot of meditation systems starts. Before Masi Saido, in Burma, there was a Moguk system. They are teaching about 12 layers of dependent origination. It's a long series. Start with Avijja, Sankara, Vijnana, and at the later, later stage only, Vedana, 
come into the something real, something tangible to the human mind. When the Jnanananda says, avijja, sankara, vijnana, nama, rupa, salayatana, that is only to the Buddha. The human being can start only with the pasa. Pasa means contact. Contact means nama, rupa. But in practice, rupa, nama. So you see the twist. See the twist. You have to be innocent. You have to be the beginner's mind. You have to listen to the teacher. Then once you develop certain amount of tangibility, verifiability of the rupa, that will definitely shed lights on the nama. So if you are going to start with nama, maybe you have some accumulated merits in the past life. If it is so, you are, you are better off. But when you are prescribing to someone, you have to start rupa nama parichyada jnana. That case never been taken by Pauk Sayadu, but he is virtually accepting the fact. So he also thinks that you have started. And then a whole Burmese 32, 33 senior uh, senators like members of um, uh, monks, they told um, uh, Pauk system is not Satipatthan. So Pauk Sayadu went to Taiwan and introduced Satipatthana Sutta no, no, Pauk is Satipatthan. Then he has to accept, start with Kayanapasana. So this is a very simple fact. Mahasi Sayadaw gave a complete talk why we should start with Rupa. Because theoretically it says Nama is first. So today the whole meditation world is completely collapsed. So they are taking Nama first. Because the book is still in Nama. And uh, <clears throat> you fairly explain how the consistency of the Buddhist teaching and how the non-consistent in the holy scripts. Recently one person went to the Middle East and showed 26 versions of Quran. Which one you are going to believe? And there was a hardcore Muslim person. He told, don't listen to this Satan. He is completely destroying us. Look aside. Don't look at it. Then he says, just see. I am giving a public talk. I am with 26 versions. In the Bible, King John version is the best. It is written out of the great demise of Jesus Christ hundred years later. That's a fabrication. That flag is taken by the Catholic Church. But the Christians, Methodists, Pentecostal, they and the Jews, this is no, um, the this not not this the version, but maybe the um, Jewish version that uh, Old Testaments. When I was in university, I participated Catholic movements, and I or one of my batchmates, the hardcore Catholic, he gave um, uh, message for the modern man. So I went to nice fab fab fabrications and stories, almost all of all of them are like Zen Buddhism. But if you go to the Bible, <laughs> you don't see this kind of thing. But the Buddhism, we see it, does that indicate Dhamma as Nicca nature? Not changing? Everything is changing? So earlier I was critical about the science. Because science is telling this formula. This is permanent. This is Isaac Newton. This is liquidity, this is electricity. But lucky enough, Einstein is disproving kind of, um, uh, the, um, uh, Isaac Newton. And everyone is disproving other. So it is called creativity, development and all the kind of thing. But there is a kind of a hardcore basic thing in the science. Only two things. One thing, repeatability. Whoever it do, have, should have the same result. That's all science. All the others are nonsense. But here also, the Buddha is teaching four noble truths, independent origination, never these things aren't being taught in even in Pirivena. You go and see Pirivena syllabus. You go and see Sunday school Pirivena. Uh, Sunday school uh, syllabus. You go and see our Buddhist uh, syllabus in the schools, never touch it. But they are not attractive. They are very, 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 very boring. 
very monotonous. So they say, don't talk about that. How can we teach these things to the young people? They must have something creative, something productive. So therefore teaching Patitrahampada is only for the elderly people, uh, those who are ready to die. Monks are never touching. So Vedabha Dhammika told me, don't think that uh, Nikaya separation in the uh, Buddhism uh, have any doubt about the teaching of the Buddha, no. Don't have mistakes. But in the other uh, holy scripts, they believe holy script is permanent. God is permanent. It is Mahatma, you have a Jeeva Atma, the, the original soul, uh, Paramatma. Paramatma is there, you have an individual soul, so your endurance is to merge with the Paramatma. The Buddha says it is universal law. It is not the Buddha's creation. So only in a discussion like that we can highlight it. Very difficult to teach in the classrooms. Because we have to live up to that. Then only we can understand there is a Namancha Rupancha Paticca Passa. But you can understand Rupancha Namancha Paticca Passa. Rupa is the only thing scientifically you can verify. Nama you can't. We were just discussing concept and reality. Nama is just a concept. Oh, maybe a concept, but Rupa is not concept. It's concrete. It's solid. It has at least three dimensions. With breadth and the here, um, depth. But now we are talking about the eleven dimension. So many people um, uh, bypass it. No, 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 no. We are we are learning the uh, learning Rupa is Montessori. We are starting with the advanced classes. We are going with Vedana Anupasana, Chitta Anupasana, Dhamma Anupasana. All jokes. All jokes. They are, they are glaring like many people are coming and few days time they commit suicide. So there is no base. Base is with the Rupa. Rupa is not Nibbana, but that is the stepping stone. That's the diving board. But to get into the edge of the Rupa, then only you can dive into the <coughs> Nama. So my physics understanding was really helpful when Mahasi Saito, when Pauk Saito, the Pandita Saito says, when you see the air element, see its character, nature, uh, the manner, and the nature. It says uh, Akhara, no, uh, Santana Panyati, Akhara Panyati, Sobhava Lakkana. So he wrote a different essay, just teaching physics. How is the air column? What the, what the akar? It's like a swing or like a moving door. And then the, um, first with the santana, the shape, and then the manner is starting with slowly and ending, but with the hard, fast, or start with the fast and slowly coming down. These are the manners. Once you go beyond that only, you go to the Sabahavalakana, and then you are ready to go to Nama, Nama, Nama Kanda, or Vedana. No, I, so when we are conducting a retreat like that, many people from different traditions comes. Almost they are teaching me, no, no, Bhante Rupa is very, very Montessori. We don't like it, we like Vipassana, we like Nama. We have to start with Vedana Nupasana. We have to start with uh, of the Chitta Anupasana. It will be a higher grade. So, Mahasi Sahib, Sahib says, start your interview report with the primary object. That must be the starting point. Otherwise, I am not listening. Bringing you back to the zero. Bringing you back to the beginner's mind. Bringing you back to the Rupa. And after say, telling about that, you can say how it is changing from the shape and the manner and the natural characteristic, then naturally you are in Nama. Then teacher can understand. You have nothing to teach to the teacher. So that humbleness, that beginner's mind, appear like arrogance for the educated people. They are fool-headed. So when, we are, when the West started uh, mindfulness, they started with Vipassana. 
they they never appreciated Samatha. Pavoksadu only gave some kind of a push to the Samatha. Achan Brahm gave some kind of a push to the Samatha. But <laughs> there was a mistake. They were not doing something original, they were reacting. Pavoksadu was reacting against Mahashi system. The other person is reacting against the Goenka system. But Mahasi system and Goenka system is per, per, the pertainable, how to call it, sustainable. These things are going up and down because they are just reactions. So lucky enough, I had the traditional way, just be with Rupa. And understand the contact with present of Rupa, but if he wants to go deep, Pasa has two lobes. Uh, I can't remember the particular name. Uh, Rupa base and Nama base. You know, Katukunda Jananda completely explain it with the uh, quotation of the Sutta. And he says, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name. So, na- Pasa is considered as a mental concomitant. But it has some relations with the Rupa, some relations with the Nama, and you have to start with Rupa, because it is verifiable. That verifiability is the only thing make Buddhism not a religion. It is scientific, but only at the beginning. Soon when it goes from the Rupa to the Nama, again it goes to the mind science. Again, there is no verifiability. If you have any doubt, again you have to come to the Rupa, breath, the sitting posture, the walking posture. And again start with, then that particular Rupa will make the ladder for you to go to the Nama. You can't go. If you go with your selfish idea, I never happy with that kind of people. They are in a fantasizing. They are in the mental hallucination. They claim they are very big shots, but often they have to have the psychedelics. Otherwise they can't live. They look down at the non-meditators, but those who started with Rupa as a consistent growth. So, simply put, in Zen mind, beginner's mind, Suzuki completely caught at that. Because Zen Buddhism is based on the mentality. He says, take the lesson from the Theravada, be a beginner's mind. Always start with the beginners, the breath you can touch. The leg you are keeping on the leg, uh, ground, you can touch. The morsel you are eating, you can touch. The water you are bathing, you can touch. That touch is the passer, start with Rupa. So therefore, it is from the one, two, three, four system, not starting with the higher levels, and that is a kind of a mental imbalance, I would say. Mental aberration, I would say. Better start with the beginners. It's a very good example is when we are teaching young children at the grade four, easily they can catch. And the sometimes children with the age six, easily they can catch. Because they don't know Buddhism. They don't know theory. When you sit, what do you feel? I feel this. Touching on the ground. How long? Uh, Not much. Monkey mind is jumping. But again, I can come to the touching. I can come to the breath. So much so. Therefore, even though we are talking about this Attaka Vagga, Parayana Vagga, please don't forget that you have to start with ABCD system. Otherwise, this is called this is called uh, misunderstanding or uh, wrong view only to meditators. There are six wrong views only happening for the meditators. Present day, when uh, uh, Chandratana is making a uh, statement, quoting it from uh, Sabbasava Sutta, you can understand non-meditators are very easy to tackle. Meditators are almost like mad people. They are living in asylum. 
living in the mind. They don't, they don't on the ground. So this discussion also you must take back to the ground. Ground yourself. When you are sitting, you must understand you are not walking. When you are walking, you must understand you are not sitting. Not the deep, deep thing, but the ties. That's all I thought of. I am very fast in talking, I am sorry. But in the rainy time, I have to speak a little louder. That you will appreciate. So, I would like to know others' views also, if you have any comments, please. Um, so, in this sutta, I was hearing that we're talking about um, the contact of the mind and uh, with the uh, eye base. Uh, is this working? Okay. Um, so, um, and I, I think this everybody probably knows this is how quickly the the mind quickly uh, perceives the object as mine. We so quickly uh, think that we own the object or that uh, I am a self. And uh, so we're quickly deceived that uh, things are belonging to us. And so this is something that is uh, impressive. Um, and I can see where that would be a reason for not starting with um, the Nama, rather to start with Rupa, because the mind is so deceptive and quickly fabricating reality to be mine um, and so forth. And that um, where rather um, if you're, if you have to try to identify reality, uh, Rupa is much more um, reliable because it's, it doesn't, change. I mean, it's changing. You can see it changing, but uh, it's more substantial. It's more verifiable than our mental um, quickness and deceptiveness. So I could, I can just, I can see this, um, the Buddha's teaching here uh, in that way, uh, this way I am understanding it. Um, Thank you, Swaminans. I am happy that Americans are understanding Dhamma. You have to go and teach Donald Trump. You have to go and teach Joe Biden. The bloody fellows going to lead the world without even a clue about Nama Rupa, without you have to start with Rupa. Oh, Nama is non concern. They are concerned about the Ukraine. They are concerned about the cruise missiles, Star Wars. And they say they are the first world country. I mean, first, first world madness. New, new madness order. New world order is the madness. George Bush the two started bloody game. Now we are, we are seeing, we are observing all the scientific developments to lose the people something to eat, lose the people something to wear to live, something to wear and to have medicine. Again the world has come to the Nama Rupa. So I am very happy after a few years of time uh, we are grounding, we are grounding uh, to the earth rather than making mention in the, uh, on the sky. Thank you, Bhantes, for um, the wonderful comments. Um, that is one thing that I've always appreciated about <clears throat> Lord Buddha's teachings, about how it's a very kind of gradual training. There's very much like this step-by-step -step process leading to subtler and subtler levels. <clears throat> because it's very easy, I find, for um, the mind in general to kind of leap too far uh, a lot of times. And um, 
not know its own limits. And so, in a lot of ways that the Buddha taught, um, whether it's from sila to samadhi to panya, or from uh, rupa to vedana to sanya and sankara, vijnana and so forth, there's always this kind of um, building block element to it. Um, and and the um, it, it kind of helps because I find that maybe a lot of people come into Buddhism, myself included, um, in the beginning because it's uh, it has this depth to it, which is just incredible. Um, this kind of feeling that there is some really deep things going on here that I want to know. But then we also realize, oh, I'm still kind of human. I still have all these problems and defilements. So how do I actually get to that level? And um, and for that, the Buddha lays down a very practical path of training. And um, to start with these... Um, getting to know very simply the basics, the rupa before the nama, the kaya before the chitta, and things like this, um, they help develop, I feel, a more solid ground for the deeper levels. And so, um, yes, the, uh, I do feel that that's what needs to be done first. Uh, thank you, Navasarai uh, Bhante. Excuse me. Um, thank you uh, to all the Bhantes for uh, the wonderful comments. And um, it's a good uh, discussion that we're having about uh, Nama and Rupa. And uh, it's I, I just wanted to point out, you know, this this is the interesting thing. One of the things that I like so much about the Buddhist teachings is that <laughs> when we talk about Nama and Rupa, Kaya Nupasana, Veda Nupasana, uh, chitta nupasana, all that stuff. There's so many different levels of wisdom, and so many layers of of wisdom, and um, there are just so many different ways you can approach the practice. And I remember when I was uh, in California at the the Pao Kermitage, I was staying at Venerable Ua Ganya when he was there. He was telling me, he's like, yeah, you know, if this doesn't work in your meditation, then you can try this, then you can try this, then you can try this. There's just so many different ways of approaching practice. So, uh, and it's and it's funny, you, you know, we, uh, we were talking, me and uh, Bhante Dhamma last night we were talking about uh, <laughs> sila and mindfulness. And, you know, he was like saying one thing, I was saying another thing. But at the end of the day, what I was saying is that everything to me goes hand in hand. It's like, you know, you have one thing here and you have one thing here and they build upon each other. So, you know. It's like the four foundations of mindfulness. They build upon each other. It's not like totally separate from each other. It just builds upon each other. Uh, Tulo Bhante was, was kind of saying that to me too. But um, it's like sila, discipline, and uh, and mindfulness. They just kind of build build upon each other. And uh, I, I feel like they're not really separate from each other. And But that's, I think, the beauty of the Buddhist teachings as we're going over now. Is there's just so many different layers of wisdom that you can use in your practice. And, uh, yeah, I just thank you all for the, the great comments. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful to see, you know, all the different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. Franz? No talk. Um, thank you, uh, our venerable sir. Uh, thank you, other monks, as well, <clears throat> for the great comments. Um, two things. One is um, we are talking here about contact and the desire. And when Bhante said that we will have to basically uh, concentrate or pay, at pay our attention to uh, Rupa, um, uh, for me, I feel uh, bringing the attention to the breath is the place where you have the highest craving because breath is life in itself. So if there is no breath, there is no life. So whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, uh, Lord Buddha is taking your attention to your life and the place where there is no craving, uh, place where you have the highest craving, but when you are living, uh, you just give a damn about it. At the time of death only, you know what you are really looking for when it is too late. So therefore, um, 
uh, although we don't see, although it is not very clear. Um, Buddha is a genius in that regard. He doesn't say um, what to expect or what will happen. He just takes you there. And it depends on your, your wisdom. It depends on your intelligence to understand why he is doing after practicing for quite some time. And uh, coming back to the second point, uh, what we were discussing last night. <laughs> and uh, mm, he was saying, Sila is, uh, basically that was what we were discussing, Sila is more important. And I was saying, no, mindfulness is more important. And uh, virtue is a product of mindfulness rather than the other way around. So that's what I want to add. I don't know if I was saying Sila was more important. I was, again, I think I was just... Like I said a second ago, you know, everything goes hand in hand. That was that was my take on it. It's like, you know, you have the sila, you have that, you're practicing that, and then you have the mindfulness. So you can start with sila or mindfulness. It, I, what I was trying to say is that whatever you practice, the other one is should be fed by the first one. So if you're practicing, if you're approaching it from the mindfulness aspect, then the sila should come from that. If you Practicing the sila aspect and the mindfulness should come from that. It builds upon each other. That's that's what I'm, that's what I was saying. That's the gist of the same with samatha and vipassana. They 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 go hand in hand. It's like two sides of the same coin. You know, they they you need you need both. You know, yeah yeah. So anyhow, yeah. With uh, sila and sati, oh, what should I say? Um, with sila and sati, for example, I think. Um, you're both very right that kind of you need mindfulness to be able to restrain yourself and keep your virtue. Um, but if you want to develop your mindfulness deeply, then you need to have that virtuous mindset as well. Um, I think maybe the reason that it's often put first on the list is because um, sila is kind of a very practical thing. Um, sati can get very airy, and like what um, it can be quite. Um, uh, deep and profound um, and so for a lot of people um, what they need is just to know how to actually like manage their lives <laughs> without feeling like they're screwing up all the time um, and that will make for a much less shaky kind of mindfulness but even to do that you need mindfulness and so <laughs> like you were saying oh, so how they all come around Uh, I remember the two terms, maybe too much or too deep, the passa. Kantaka is adivachana sampasa, patika sampasa. Patika sampasa means something come together, touch. Uh, that kind of a touch, that kind of a contact. Adivachana sampasa is whatever you contact, you have a naming, you have the nomenclature. So he used the term bending to the Materiality is the commentarial name for the Nama, is Namana Lakkana. But when Jnananda vehemently reject it. And he says, just name. Don't put that uh, Namana Lakkana. But uh, when I'm deep understanding, try to understand the uh, quantum physics, he says the mind has some kind of attraction to male, has attraction to the female, people have attraction to the money, and beauty, so mind is have kind of a bending to his own desirable things. So, commentator says that bending nature, that a lot of monks are here, I have only one monk is favorable, the other monk is not favorable. Then I have... Uh, bending away. Yeah, bending away or uh, bending away or forward. So, when Jnananda took the Adivachana Sampasa. Adivachana Sampasa is sometimes known as... Uh, Akar Lincoln Uddesa. We call they are lay people. Well, they are monks. And take monks. He's a Samanir. The other one also left Samanir. They are monks. What is the difference? And blah, blah, blah. And he says, Samanir, Upasampada. Blah, blah. We gave so much of nomenclature. And that is what we learn in physics, uh, botany and zoology. The bilingual, duolingual nomenclature. So, Buddha says, everything is polluted by a name. Not named, anything not named, not recognized, never create any defilement. The world is full of names, that way our world is full of defilements. 
So this Adivachana Sampasa, Patika Sampasa, whenever materiality is concerned, it's called Patika Sampasa. Patika is usually named as the hatred. Patika, but it's not the, the contact. The, the, the friction, the, the, the rubbing, the wear and tear, that is Patika. Adivachana Sampasa is, I say this is the running pulley, this is the driven pulley, this is the uh, driving pulley. So likewise we gave a nomenclature, then the problem started. Whatever is there, if you have considered as not seen, or even if you see, if you are not fab- not fabricating, that's gone. No patika sampasa, no adivachana sampasa. So therefore, whenever these things are there, we call that our favorable subject. I like physics, I like chemistry, I know these things and kind of thing. I would like to teach you. Would you want to teach your favorable subject? So we get engaged in the worldly things and outwardly. So therefore, Patika Sampasa, Ajivatana Sampasa, the Buddha is asking for Venubar Ananda, Ananda, the Patika Sampasa has four characters, Linga, Nimiti, Uddesa, Akar. It has a manner. The particular materiality, the, I will say, earth element, has its own manner. It has its own uh, shape. Shape, manner, uh, linga, nimiti, akara. Nimitta, we have specific character. How we differ from the earth element. Characteristic, Characteristic of the specific characters. And then the name. So the Buddha says, when there is an earth element, we'll say we have a tooth. And when it is shape, changing into another one, decayed tooth, or there is a uh, plaque, and it's problematic. So then what happened to the early nature of the Patika Sampasa to your teeth, they're very beautiful, and how the toothpaste people are advertising, and once it's gone different, you are not happy to say it's a good good teeth and I have to go to a doctor and all the time because it has shaped, I mean, changed the shape, changed its natural characteristics and its uh, specific character. It's a name. And if you go to a doctor and say the, the dentist, he don't usually say teeth. He says the, the first teeth, second teeth, third. they have different names. So much names. And then you have to learn. What happens is they are always changing. Always changing. When you take the Patika Sampasa into four, four columns, Akara, Linga, Nimiti, Uddesa, you see ever changing, you can fix the bones and the teeth and the other hard elements. You recognize because it has some practical meaning for you, economical meaning for you, therefore it is important. Go to temple tooth relic in Kandy. Oh, non Buddhist. Nothing. For us, it's the most sacred thing. When you go there, we take a bath and worship and all the kind of thing. Because we have these four characteristics. We think these characteristics are permanent. It is not. And then Nama, Sampa, Adivachana Sampasa, also, your value in your country is not value in my country. Because we are taken brace up in the different uh, cultures. But we can live together. We have to understand it. So therefore, Adivachana Sampasa, Patika Sampasa, when you cut into two, one monk came from Nepal, he says, Pasa is a material, it is not a mental concomitant. But the Pasa has some branch, it's dealing with the materiality, corporeality, the, the, the three-dimensional concrete thing. And some other thing is nomenclature. And when you are learning, you are fixing something, but the other person will fix in the different category, different way. So we are fighting. <coughs> so in Mahanidana Sutta, <coughs> Buddha is giving completely uh, overhaul age about the term pasa. Definitely, when Banyananda is taken into the concept and reality, and after in his uh, Nibbana sermons, I'm so happy I came as a lay person, when he started the Nibbana Sermon number 2. Then he asked me to do recording. We have very poor recording system. And he used to give me his structure before giving the lecture, all the suttas. So later, before going to Burma, I told him we will publish it. 
Thursday, he refused. He told it will be leading contradiction. So I took a typewriter. I never learned typewriting. And typewriter is still I am with me. Someone has thrown away. I kept it as a uh, monument and started typing. Whenever Jnana Rama came, what are you doing? Then I tell, I don't know, Bhante, you're a typewriter. It's a very old one. I am like, do you know how to uh, type uh, Bandiyakuru? The words, that, eh? binding. binding, two letters? No. Uh, this is the way you have to learn. So I typed it from the 22 to 33. Typesetting. We have no computers at that time. And one another monk took the responsibility about 1 to 22 and then gave it to the the printing. And then the printer, when Vanyanada went through word by word, because his own work. So I have my own uh, history. In the early part of Nibbana, he has written my name. Dhammajiva is the one who typed it. And now I would have read it more than 33 times. Very deep. But if you wish to learn, Patpasa, if you wish to learn Adivachana Sampasa, Patika Sampasa, you will give up meditation. You will disrobe. You will never learn Buddhism. We we'll theoretically explain all quantum physics, all how the, the, the concepts become a reality, how the realistic thing become a concept, how the hallucination can come, how you are sending mad, how you are sending kites in terms of meditation. So therefore I recommend, but it's a great task. It's a great task. So we hit, we stumble upon the term pasa, and now onward, this particular sutta itself is dealing with pasa. In singular, you know the meaning of pasa? Buttocks. Pasa, some pasa? You like to touch it, is yeah, there is some pasa. You know, pasa? Pasa vajya vedana? <laughs> when you are sitting long time, you have pain in the buttocks. Pasa vajya vedana. So in your meditating, if you don't understand even the Pasapachya Vedana, you are not a good meditator. Fifteen minutes time you can understand Pasapachya Vedana, aren't you? So Pasa, be, be dangerous word, be careful when you are using uh, for the singular audience. So you have to understand Pasa. But be here the Mahaprana Pa, uh, in, usually in the colloquial language it's a Pa. Passa. This is passa, but in the, in the pronunciation, very difficult to understand the height, um, this thing. So, therefore, deepest part of the Patitsampa is understanding passa pacha vedana. You have to give a sermon for three hours. So, everyone starts to pay, uh, get the pain in the buttocks, so they understand passa pacha vedana. It is not one single hour, hour Dhamma talk. Udhuamduru? Yeah, we, we just mentioned earlier on about wisdom. Um, um, one of the qualities of wisdom is that it is deep. And um, you know it's not wisdom when it's shallow and black and white. So, the, like, uh, so, so when you see things from many aspects, this is also wisdom. So this is another aspect or characteristic of, of, of wisdom. And then another aspect of wisdom is, is that it is emergent. Um, so, for instance, uh, we don't see where the traffic jam is. It's not in the street. It's not in the car. It's not in the drivers. It's an emergent quality from the interactions of time and place and cars and streets and all of these phenomena coming together. You can say it's statistical. So we don't see temperature. St uh, temperature is a statistical phenomena. It, it arises because of the population. It, arise, it arises because of the the number, the frequency coming together, the combination. So the, earlier on we were mentioning about this interaction, this dynamic between sila and, and um, dhamma, sila and, and uh, sati, you know, sila and development of the mind. So uh, initially you can say these things are separate, but uh, actually they're not. True sila is not. Of course there's, there's the wrong sila, micha sila, 
which is just like uh, silly rules for silly things. Or uh, we can have an agreed sealer. For instance, in some countries we drive on the right side of the road, in some countries we drive on the left side of the road. There's, there's nothing profound or fundamental about what side of the road we drive on, but it, it is important because out of that sila emerges, we'll say, safe driving and safe passage. Um, so we can also just understand these qualities, and uh, wisdom has this ability to see from many different aspects. So uh, when, when people are limited, they see in a black and white way. And when they have wisdom, they see in a multifold way and they see deeply and they see uh, a sort of uh, a surface level and then another level and another level and another level. Um, and like things that are, are deep in quality have that ability to draw one down into deeper and deeper and deeper levels. So certain topics like, say, Kamma is a very, very deep topic. If you, if you give it any consideration, it starts to uh, fall away. One level becomes another, becomes another, becomes another. Or uh, things like contact itself, like the, which is just one of a series of um, mental activities or phenomena, a uh, uh, process that is happening in the mind. Um, it is like one of the stages, um, whereas uh, if you see when people don't um, say I have enough experience, enough uh, direct experience with their own mind, with the processes of their mind, uh, they, they have a very, um, very uh, cardboard, very empty, very superficial understanding of the nature of the mind, whereas if you're very familiar with the nature of the mind, you see uh, all of these different components, you see all of these different processes are um, happening and uh, as we go into the next verse, uh, uh, it becomes, uh, the next verse really gets into this kind of, the, 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 the almost like the shadow land between uh, different qualities around what, what the verse is talking about is perception. So even the thing that we, we think we perceive, we think we know something is there in front of us, um, there are many different layers to that knowing. So uh, the, the mind is a very subtle thing, and uh, it has uh, the person who is familiar with the mind understands that it's a very subtle thing and understands that there are many different interconnecting processes and that those processes all act together just like the, the cars in a traffic jam. Out of it emerges qualities like sila, and, and those, that good sila has many different um, aspects to it, like it, it is bright, it is shiny, and um, it, it sort of reflects the dirt away, it reflects the defilements off, uh, it is cool, it is not heaty or frictive, uh, it is bright, it is illuminating, and it is, sustain, it is uh, sustaining and supporting the cultivation and development of wisdom. And wisdom without sila is, is not true wisdom either, it's rotten as well. So uh, you need sila, you need wisdom, they both emerge together. And uh, it's a characteristic of somebody who is cu cultivating wisdom is that their sila improves. And it is a characteristic of a wise person uh, that as they develop their uh, sila, that their wisdom will Im improve. And you can't separate these things out as a certain, you know, they, they are inter are interbeing. They inter-exist. Um, so when we get into discussions about which comes first, it's very much a chicken and egg kind of thing, and one has to realize that they both come together. They are not something where the egg comes first or the chicken comes first. They both come together. There is no chicken and there is no egg. They both come together. There is no sila. There is no um, panya. They both come together and so forth. So... Uh, um, so this is why uh, actually this whole idea of contact is very, very important. Uh, when, we, when we learn to recognize contact is happening, then we can sit inside that with, with consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, smell consciousness, touch consciousness, and also consciousness of the mind itself. And we can sit uh, uh, inside that door of one of those six doors of perception, and then we become a master of our mind, and that is mindfulness. It is like the foreman, uh, or it's like the executive that is watching all of those six sense doors, and it is watching what is arising at those doors, and whatever is arising is, is arising present and passing away. And again, in the next verse, we will get into all about perception. Um, I have a very kind of uh, basic practical question. 
but it has to do with um, one could say contact contacts and um, desires and possessions um, but it's related to kind of the brahmacharya and our life and so if um, any of the um, teras or any one else who might have some um, comments I'd be appreciative to hear but I suppose uh, at times in the beginning when the mind is still not so firm um, very kind of far away external things can really shake one in particular if something happens in one's family um, if things are happening to um, family members that is actually like quite serious um, then uh, this kind of feeling of um, compassion arises that one doesn't want to see them suffer um, one doesn't want to um, kind of uh, have them like f- fall down the drain but at the same time one knows um, that this holy life is not one where I, I can just give myself fully to um, kind of helping them and especially because I don't know enough Dhamma yet I cannot teach it and so what are some ways to both benefit myself and others um, in what kind of levels and strengths um, if Bhantes have any ideas um, as to one kind of um, quite uh, yeah, upsetting things happen yeah when we are starting the mindful school we teach mindfulness when we are le- teaching mindfulness how the children can understand the family members suffering they, I try to be here and now I am may we be successful but my brother, but my sister, they don't know mindfulness. They are maybe doing wrong thing and they are suffering. So then how can I have the emotional intelligence, emotional literacy, emotional illiteracy? So British government told, not only mindfulness, you have to learn, teach compassion. And then there's one article, I have an article. And he says, that is why bear attention is not enough. Just mere mindfulness is not enough. You have to teach uh, compassion. So I, the Bhikkhu Bodhi remarked three times on the Power of Mindfulness book, telling Mahathero, Jnanaponika Mahathero is prescribing bare attention, but it is not enough. Mm-hmm. He was the best disciple of the Jnanaponikas. Therefore, the writer of the article sent it to Bhikkhu Bodhi, telling Bhante, you remember, you, re- you remarked uh, 40 years ago, their attention is not enough. Now, British government is telling. Because people become self-centered. People become callous to the family members. So therefore, mindful people must teach compassion. So Bhikkhu Bodhi sent me the article telling Tamil you are teaching mindfulness. Have you ever considered about this? Would you mind to add? If it's not too late, now you can add compassion into this thing. So immediately with the article, I went to his place, Brisbane. I gave a talk on Sati Sampajanya Sutta. It says Sati Sampajanya is the basic thing for the sila. Without Sati Sampajanya, no sila. Other way around also possible. So then I made a conclusion with Sati, not the compassion, wisdom. Sampajanya is the basic thing you have to do. Then compassion is natural arising that now my mission is to teach the world, teach everyone, when you are mindful, always keep wisdom, power with mindfulness, sati sampajanya, and uh, compassion is outcome. Otherwise, the compassion is a perversion of hatred. Karuna mukhena, dosang, dosa muk, karuna mukhena, dosang vancheti. But if you are doing something, I know him, he see, I have emotional intelligence, I am mindful, I have wisdom, then I can tell, if you like, I can do it for you. But I will give his consent. But if you are doing compassion, you don't ask him, you go and do something because he is your family member. And that is the way the whole world is messed. They don't understand the undermining, uh, the perversion of the hatred. And uh, the joke is, you know, the compassion is known as Karuna. My lay name is Karuna Ratna. I completely give up. I have no compassion. I try to uh, understand through the wisdom, 
and the mindfulness at the wisdom as it is a universal thing. The other party will not understand, but I don't care about that. I try to understand, then I know the compassion coming, the oozing out of that is no remarks, no hatred. Otherwise, uh, euthanasia, you know, how it comes? Come out of compassion. You kill your father. Mahasi Sahib also was killed. Because he went vegetable. Doctor came, Bhante, this is the situation. He is not going to recover. I am going to take a decision, pay respect and get out. Otherwise you are in trouble. Parajika. So you know paramedics what they are doing? On the euthanasia? Yeah, it's a no end. But the wisdom wise, you understand, don't touch it because let the nature to decide. Don't take to kill or don't take to decision to leave it on the machine. Uh, it's a matter of money. It's a matter of bloody health science. They are the people taking money out of that. And there's a one doctor called as Dr. Death in Holland. He go and remove the machine. But you have to pay. Is he compassion? So therefore, take, if you take grant into my words, the wisdom and then the compassion will be the outcome. So we have to stop the discussion. Today is very good. Everyone was participating, but time up. Thank you very much for the participation.